Chapter 1 Anniversary Present Major Malice Dewerden shifted uneasily on the stone throne in the small and darkened ante room to the great chapel of House Dewerden. To the Dark Elves who measured time's passage in decades, this was a day to be marked in the annals of Malice's house. The tenth anniversary of the ongoing covert conflict between the Dewerden family and House Hanet. Major Malice, never one to miss a celebration, had a special present prepared for her enemies. Riza Dewerden, Malice's eldest daughter, a large and powerful drow female, paced about the anteroom anxiously, a not uncommon sight. It should be finished by now, she grumbled as she kicked a small three-legged stool. It skidded and tumbled, chipping away a piece of mushroom stem seat. Patience, my daughter, Malice replied, somewhat recriminatory, though she shared Breeze's sentiments. Jarlaxle is a careful one. Breeze turned away at the mention of the outrageous mercenary and moved to the room's ornately carved stone doors. Malice did not miss the significance of her daughter's actions. You do not approve of Jarlaxle and his band? The matron mother stated flatly. They are houseless rogues, Breeze spat in response, still not turning to face her mother. There is no place in Menzo Baranzan for houseless rogues. They disrupt the natural order of our society, and they are males. They serve us well, Malice reminded her. Riza wanted to argue about the extreme cost of hiring the mercenary band, but she wisely held her tongue. She and Malice had been at odds almost continually since the start of the Doward and Honnet War. Without breaking the earth... We could not take action against our enemies, Alice continued. Using the mercenaries, the houseless rogues as you have named them, allows us to wage war without implicating our house as the perpetrator. Then why not be done with it? Riza demanded, spinning back toward the throne. We kill a few Hanet soldiers, they kill a few of ours, and all the while, both houses continue to recruit replacements. It will not end. The only winners in the conflict are the mercenaries of Burgundy Earth, and whatever band Matron Sinefe Hanet has hired, feeding off the coffers of both houses. Watch your tone, my daughter, Malice growled as an angry reminder. You are addressing a matron mother. Riza turned away again. We should have attacked House Hanet immediately on the night Zactophane was sacrificed, she dared to grumble. You forget the actions of your youngest brother on that night. Malice replied evenly. But the matron mother was wrong. If she lived a thousand more years, Riza would not forget Driss' actions on the night he had forsaken his family. Trained by Zacnafane, Malice's favorite lover and reputably the finest weapons master in all of Menzo Berenzon, Driss had achieved a level of fighting ability far beyond the drow norm. But Zac had also given Driss the troublesome and blasphemous attitudes that Loth, the Spider Queen deity of the Dark Elves, would not tolerate. Finally, Driss' sacrilegious ways had invoked Loth's wrath, and the Spider Queen, in turn, had demanded his death. Matron Malice, impressed by Driss' potential as a warrior, had acted boldly on Driss' behalf, and had given Zacnafane's heart to Loth to compensate for Driss' sins. She forgave Driss in the hopes that, without Zacnafane's influences, he would amend his ways and replace the disposed weapons master. In return, though, the ungrateful Driss had betrayed them all, had run off into the Underdark, an act that had not only robbed House Dewerden of its only potential remaining weapons master, but also had placed Matron Malice and the rest of the Dewerden family out of Loth's favor. In the disastrous end of all their efforts, House Dewerden had lost its premier weapons master, the favor of Loth, and its would-be weapons master. It had not been a good day. Luckily, House Hanet had suffered similar woes on that same day losing both its wizards in a botched attempt to assassinate Drist. With both houses weakened and in Loth's disfavor, the expected war had been turned into a calculated series of covert raids. Breeza would never forget. A knock on the anteroom door startled Breeza and her mother from their private memories of that fateful time. The door swung open, and Dinan, the elder boy of the house, walked in. Greetings, matron mother, he said in an appropriate manner, and dipping into a low bow. Dinan wanted his news to be a surprise, but the grin that found its way onto his face revealed everything. Jarlaxle has returned, Malice snarled in glee. Dinan turned toward the open door and the mercenary waiting patiently in the corridor strode in. Breeza, ever amazed at the rogue's unusual mannerisms, shook her head as Jarlaxle walked past her. 
Nearly every dark elf in Menzo Berenzon dressed in a quiet and practical manner in robes adorned with the symbols of the Spider Queen or in supple chain link armor under the folds of a magical and camouflaging Puifui cloak. Jolaxel, arrogant and brash, followed few of the customs of Menzo Berenzon's inhabitants. He was most certainly not the norm of drow society, and he flaunted the differences openly, brazenly. He wore not a cloak, nor a robe, but a shimmering cape that showed every color in the spectrum both in the glow of light and in the infrared spectrum of heat-sensing eyes. The cape's magic could only be guessed, but those closest to the mercenary leader indicated that it was very valuable indeed. Jalaxel's vest was sleeveless and cut so high that his slender and tightly muscled stomach was open for all to view. He kept a patch over one eye, though careful observers would understand it as an ornamental, for Jalaxel often shifted it from one eye to the other. My dear Breeza, Jalaxel said over his shoulder, noting the high priestess's disdainful interest in his appearance. He spun about and bowed low, sweeping off the wide brimmed hat. Another oddity, and even more so since the hat was overly plumed in the monstrous feathers of a ditrama, a gigantic underdark bird, as he stooped. Riza huffed and turned away at the sight of the mercenary's dipping head. Drow elves wore their thick white hair as a mantle of their station, each cut designed to reveal rank and house affiliation. Jarlaxle, the rogue, wore no hair at all, and from Riza's angle his clean-shaven head appeared as a ball of pressed onyx. Jalaxel laughed quietly at the continuing disapproval of the eldest Doherty and daughter, and turned back towards Matron Malice, his ample jewelry tinkling and his hard and shiny boots clumping with every step. Brisa took note of this as well, for she knew that those boots and that jewelry only seemed to make noise when Jalaxel wished them to do so. It is done, Matron Malice asked before the mercenary could even begin to offer a proper greeting. My dear Matron Malice! Jarlaxel replied with a pained sigh, knowing that he could get away with the informalities in light of his grand news. Did you doubt me? Surely I am wounded to my heart. Malice leapt from her throne, her fist clenched in victory. Deprianat is dead, she proclaimed. The first noble victim of the war. You forget Maso Hanet, remarked Brisa, slain by Driss ten years ago. And Zach Nefane de Worden, Brisa had to add against her better judgment. Killed by your own hand. Zacnafane was not noble by birth, Malice sneered at her impertinent daughter. Breeze's words stung Malice nonetheless. Malice had decided to sacrifice Zacnafane in Driss' stead against Breeze's recommendations. Jolaxel cleared his throat to deflect the growing tension. The mercenary knew that he had to finish his business and be out of House Doerden as quickly as possible. Already he knew, though the Doerdens did not, that the appointed hour drew near. There is the matter of my payment, he reminded Malice. Dinan will see to it, Malice replied with a wave of her hand, not turning her eyes from her daughter's pernicious stare. I will take my leave, Jarlaxle said, nodding to the elder boy. Before the mercenary had taken his first steps toward the door, Virna, Malice's second daughter, burst into the room, her face glowing brightly in the infrared spectrum, heated with obvious excitement. Damn, Jarlaxle whispered under his breath. What is it? Matron Malice demanded. How Sinet? Vierna cried. Soldiers in the compound! We are under attack! Out in the courtyard, beyond the cavern complex, nearly 500 soldiers of House Sinet, fully a hundred more than the house reportedly possessed, followed the blast of the lightning bolt through House Doerd and Zadamantine gates. The 350 soldiers of Doerd and Household swarmed out of the shaped stalagmite mounds that served as their quarters to meet the attack. Outnumbered but trained by Zacnafane, the Doerden troops formed into proper defensive positions, shielding their wizards and clerics so that they might cast their spells. An entire contingent of Hunnet soldiers, empowered with enchantments of flying, swooped down the cavern wall that housed the royal chambers of House Doerden. Tiny handheld crossbows clicked and thinned the ranks of the aerial force with deadly poison-tipped darts. The aerial invaders' surprise had been achieved, though and the Doerden troops were quickly put into precarious positions. Annette has not the favor of Loth! Malice screamed. It would not dare to openly attack! She flinched at the refuting, thunderous sounds of another, and then a still another, bolt of lightning. Oh? Breeza snapped. Malice cast her daughter a threatening glare, but didn't have time to continue the argument. The normal method of attack by a drow house would involve the rush of soldiers combined with a mental barrage by the house's highest-ranking clerics. 
Malice, though, felt no mental attack, which told her beyond any doubt that it was indeed House Hanette that had come to her gates. The clerics of Hanette, out of the Spider Queen's favor, apparently could not use their loth-given powers to launch the mental assault. If they had, Malice and her daughters, also out of Spider Queen's favor, could not have hoped to counter. Why would they dare to attack? Malice wondered aloud. Breeze understood her mother's reasoning. They are bold indeed, she said, to hope that their soldiers alone can eliminate every member of our house. Everyone in the room, every drow in Menzo Baranzon, understood the brutal, absolute punishments exacted upon any house that failed to eradicate another house. Such attacks were not frowned upon, but getting caught at the deed most certainly was. Risen, the present patron of House de Worden, came into the anteroom then, his face grim. We are outnumbered and outpositioned, he said. Our defeat will be swift, I fear. Malice would not accept the news. She struck Risen with a blow that knocked the patron halfway across the floor. Then she spun on Jerlaxle. You must summon your band, Malice cried at the mercenary. Quickly! Matron! Jerlaxel stuttered, obviously at a loss. Brigandy Earth is a secretive group. We do not engage in open warfare. To do so would invoke the wrath of the ruling council. I will pay you whatever you desire, the desperate matron mother promised. But the cost! Whatever you desire, Malice snarled again. Such action, Jerlaxel began. Again, Malice did not let him finish his argument. Save my house, mercenary, she growled. Your profits will be great, but I warn you, the cost of your failure will be far greater. Jerlaxel did not appreciate being threatened, especially by a lame matron mother whose entire world was fast crumbling around her. But in the mercenary's ears, the sweet ring of the word profits outweighed the threat of the thousand times over. After ten straight years of exorbitant rewards in the Dorward and Hunnet conflict, Jerlaxel did not doubt Malice's willingness or ability to pay as promised. Nor did he doubt that this deal would prove even more lucrative than the agreement he had struck with Matron Sinefe Hanette earlier that same week. As you wish, he said to Matron Malice with a bow and a sweep of his garish hat. I will see what I can do. A wink at Dinan set the elder boy on his heels as he exited the room. When the two got out on the balcony overlooking the door and compound, they saw that the situation was even more desperate than Risen had described. The soldiers of House Deward, and those still alive, were trapped in and around one of the huge stalagmite mounds, anchoring the front gate. One of Hanette's flying soldiers dropped onto the balcony at the sight of the Dorin noble, but Dinan dispatched the intruder with a single blurring attack routine. Well done, Jolaxel commented, giving Dinan an approving nod. He moved to pat the elder boy Deward on the shoulder, but Dinan slipped out of reach. We have other business to attend to, he pointedly reminded Jolaxel. Call your troops in quickly, else I fear that House Hanette will win the day. Be at ease, my friend Dinan, Jerlaxel laughed. He pulled a small whistle from around his neck and blew into it. Dinan heard not a sound, for the instrument was magically tuned exclusively for the ears of members of Bragandy Earth. The Elder Bordeauxan watched in amazement as Jerlaxel calmly puffed out a specific cadence. Then he watched in even greater amazement as more than a hundred of House Hanette's soldiers turned against their comrades. Bregandy Earth owed allegiance only to Bregandy Earth. They could not attack us, Malice said stubbornly, pacing about the chamber. The Spider Queen would not aid them in their venture. They are winning without the Spider Queen's aid, Risen reminded her, prudently ducking into the room's farthest corner, even as he spoke the unwanted words. You said that they would never attack, Brisa growled at her mother. Even as you explained why, we could not dare to attack them. Brisa remembered that conversation vividly for it was she who had suggested the open attack on House Annette. Malice had scolded her harshly and publicly, and now Breeza meant to return the humiliation. Her voice dripped in of angry sarcasm as she aimed each word at her mother. Could it be that Matron Malice de Worden has erred? Malice's reply came in the form of a glare that wavered somewhere between rage and terror. Breeza returned the threatening look without ambiguity. And suddenly, the matron mother of House de Worden did not feel so very invincible and sure of her actions. She started forward nervously a moment later when Maya, the youngest of de Worden daughters, entered the room. They have breached the house? Brisa cried, assuming the worst. She grabbed at her snake-headed whip. And we have not even began our preparations for defense. No! Maya quickly corrected. No enemies have crossed the balcony. The battle has turned against House Annette. As I knew it would. Malice observed. 
pulling herself straight and speaking pointedly at Brisa. Foolish is the house that moves without the favor of Loth. Spider proclamation, though. Malice guessed that more than the judgment of the Spider Queen had come into play out in the courtyard. Her reasoning led her inexplicably to Jerlaxel and his untrustworthy band of rogues. Jerlaxel stepped off the balcony and used his innate drow abilities to levitate down to the cavern floor, seeing no need to involve himself in a battle that was obviously under control. Din rested back and watched the mercenary go. Considering all that had just transpired, Jarlaxle had played both sides off against one the other. And, once again, the mercenary and his band had been the only true winners. Bragging to Earth was undeniably unscrupulous, but, Dinan had to admit, undeniably effective. Dinan found that he liked the renegade. The accusation has been properly delivered to Matron Benray? Malice asked Brisa when the light of Narbundle, the magically heated stalagmite mound that served as the time clock of Menzo Baranzon, began its steady climb, marking the dawn of the next day. The ruling house expected the visit, Brisa replied with a smirk. All of the city whispers of the attack, and of how House Dorden repelled the invaders of House Annette. Malice futilely tried to hide her vain smile. She enjoyed the attention and the glory that she knew would be lavished upon her house. The ruling council will be convened this very day, Brisa went on. No doubt to the dismay of matron Sinefe Hanette and her doomed children. Malice nodded her agreement. To eradicate a rival house in Menzo Baranzon was a perfectly acceptable practice among the drow. But to fail in the attempt to leave even one witness of a noble blood live to make an accusation invited the judgment of the ruling council, a wrath that wrought absolute destruction in its wake. A knock turned them both toward the room's ornate door. You are summoned, matron, Risen said as he entered. Matron Benray has sent a chariot for you. Malice and Breeze exchanged hopeful but nervous glances. When punishment fell upon House Annette, House de Worden would move into the eighth rank of the city's hierarchy, a most desirable position. Only the matron mothers of the top eight houses were accorded a seat on the city's ruling council. Already? Breeze asked her mother. Malice only shrugged in reply and followed Risen out of the room and down to the house's balcony. Risen offered her a hand of assistance, which she promptly and stubbornly slapped away, her pride apparent with every move. Malice stepped over the railing and floated down to the courtyard, where the bulk of her remaining soldiery was gathered. The floating blue glowing disc bearing the insignia of House Benray hovered just outside the blasted adamantine gate of the door and compound. Malice proudly strolled through the gathered crowd. Dark elves fell over each other trying to get out of her way. This was her day, she decided, the day she achieved the seat on the ruling council, the position she so greatly deserved. Matron Mother, I will accompany you through the city, offered Dinan, standing at the gate. You will remain here with the rest of the family, Malice corrected. The summons is for me alone. How can you know? Dinan questioned, but he realized he had overstepped his rank as soon as the words had left his mouth. By the time Malice turned her reprimanding glare toward him, he had already disappeared into the mob of soldiers. Proper respect, Malice muttered under her breath, and she instructed the nearest soldiers to remove a section of the propped and tied gate. With a final victorious glance at her subjects, Malice stepped out and took a seat on the floating disc. This was not the first time that Malice had accepted such an invitation from Matron Benray so she was not the least bit surprised when several Benray clerics moved out from the shadows to encircle the floating disc in the protective guard. The last time Malice had made this trip, she had been tentative, not really understanding Benray's intent in summoning her. This time, though, Malice folded her arms defiantly across her chest and let the curious onlookers view her in all the splendor of her victory. Malice accepted the stairs proudly, feeling positively superior. Even when the disc reached the fabulous web-like fence of House Benray, with its thousand marching guards and towering stalagmite and stalactite structures, Malice's pride had not diminished. She was of the ruling council now, or soon would be. No longer did she have to feel intimidated anywhere in the city, or so she thought. Your presence is requested in the chapel, one of Benray's clerics said to her when the disc came to a stop at the base of the great domed building's sweeping stairs. Malice stepped down and ascended the polished stones. As soon as she entered, she noticed a figure sitting on one of the chairs atop the raised central altar. The seated drow, the only other person visible in the chapel, apparently did not notice that Malice had entered. She sat back comfortably watching the huge illusionary image at the top of the dome shift through its forms, first appearing as a gigantic spider, then a beautiful drow female. As she moved closer, Malice recognized the robes of a matron mother, and she assumed 
as she had all along, that it was Matron Benray herself, the most powerful figure in all of Menzo Berenzon, awaiting her. Malice made her way up the altar stairs, coming up behind the seated drow. Not waiting for an invitation, she boldly walked around to greet the other matron mother. It was not, however, the ancient and emaciated form of Matron Benray that Malice Doward had encountered on the dais of the Benray Chapel. The seated matron mother was not old beyond the years of a drow and as withered and dried as some bloodless corpse. Indeed, this drow was no older than Malice and quite diminutive. Malice recognized her all too well. Cinefe? She cried, nearly toppling. Malice, the other replied calmly. A thousand troublesome possibilities rolled through Malice's mind. Sinefe Hanet should have been huddling in fear in her doomed house, awaiting the annihilation of her family. Yet here Sinefe sat, comfortably in the hollowed quarters of Menzo Berenzon's most important family. You do not belong in this place, Malice protested, her slender fist clenched at her side. She considered the possibilities of attacking her rival there and then of throttling Sinefe with her own hands. Be at ease, Malice, Sinefe remarked casually. I am here by the invitation of Matron Benray, as are you. The mention of Matron Benray and the reminder of where they were calmed Malice considerably. One did not act out of sorts in the chapel of House Benray. Malice moved to the opposite end of the circular dais and took a seat, her gaze never leaving the smugly smiling face of Sinefe Hanet. After a few interminable moments of silence, Malice had to speak her mind. It was House Hanet that attacked my family in the last dark of Narbundel, she said. I have many witnesses to the fact. There can be no doubt. None, Sinefe replied, her agreement catching Malice off guard. You admit the deed? She balked. Indeed, said Sinefe. Never have I denied it. Yet you live, Malice sneered. The laws of Menzo Barons on demand justice upon you and your house. Justice? Sinefe laughed at the absurd notion. Justice had never been more than a facade and a means of keeping the pretense of order in chaotic Menzo Barons on. I acted as the Spider Queen demanded of me. If the Spider Queen approved of your methods, you would have been victorious, Malice reasoned. Not so, interrupted another voice. Malice and Sinefe turned about just as Matron Benray magically appeared, sitting comfortably in the chair farthest back on the dais. Malice wanted to scream out at the withered matron mother, both for spying on her conversation and for apparently refuting her claims against Sinefe. Malice had managed to survive the dangers of Menzo Berenzon for 500 years, though, primarily because she understood the implications of angering one such as Matron Benray. I claim the rights of accusation against House Annette, she said calmly. Granted, replied Matron Benray. As you have said, and as Sinefe agreed, there can be no doubt. Malice turned triumphantly on Sinefe, but the matron mother of House Hanette still sat relaxed and unconcerned. Then why is she here? Malice cried, her tone edged in explosive violence. Sinefe is an outlaw. She... We have not argued against your words, matron Benray interrupted. House Hanette attacked and failed. The penalties for such a deed are well known and agreed upon, and the ruling council will convene this very day to see that justice is carried through. Then why is Sinefe here? Malice demanded. Do you doubt the wisdom of my attack? Sinefe asked Malice, trying to keep the chuckle under her breath. You were defeated, Malice reminded her, matter-of-factly. That alone should provide you your answer. Hoth demanded the attack, said Matron Benray. Why then was House Annette defeated? Malice asked stubbornly. With the Spider Queen, I did not say that the Spider Queen had imbued her blessings upon House Annette, Matron Benray interrupted, somewhat crossly. Malice shifted back in her seat, remembering her place and her predicament. I said only that Loth demanded the attack, Matron Benray continued. For ten years, all of Menzo Berenzon has suffered the spectacle of your private war. The intrigue and excitement wore away long ago. Let me assure you both, it had to be decided. And it was, declared Malice, rising from her seat. House Dorden has proven victorious, and I claim the rights of accusation against Sinefe Annette and her family. Sit down, Malice, Sinefe said. There is more to this than your simple rights of accusation. Malice looked to Matron Benray for confirmation. Though considering the present situation, she could not doubt Sinefe's words. It is done, Matron Benray said to her. 
House Doerden has won, and House Annette will be no more. Malice fell back into her seat, smiling smugly at Cinefe. Still, though, the matron mother of House Annette did not seem the least bit concerned. I will watch the destruction of your house with great pleasure, Malice assured her rival. She turned to Benray. When will punishment be exacted? It is already done, Matron Benray replied mysteriously. Cinefe lives, Malice cried. No, the withered matron mother corrected. She who was Cinefe Annette lives. Now Malice was beginning to understand. House Benray had always been opportunistic. Could it be that Matron Benray was stealing the High Priestesses of House Annette to add to their own collection? You will shelter her? Malice dared to ask. No, Matron Benray replied evenly. That task will fall to you. Malice's eyes went wide. Of all the many duties she had ever been appointed in her days as a High Priestess of Loth, she could think of none more distasteful. She is my enemy! You ask that I give her shelter? She is your daughter, Matron Benry shot back. Her tone softened and a wry smile cracked her thin lips. Your oldest daughter, return from travels to Ched Nazad or some other city of our kin. Why are you doing this? Malice demanded. It is unprecedented. Not completely correct, replied Matron Benry. Her fingers tapped together out in front of her while she sank back within her thoughts remembering some of the strange consequences of the endless line of battles within the Drow City. Outwardly, your observations are correct, she continued to explain to Malice, but surely you are wise enough to know that many things occur behind the appearances in Menzo Baranzon. House Annette must be destroyed. That cannot be changed. And all of the nobles of House Annette must be slaughtered. It is, after all, the civilized thing to do. She paused a moment to ensure that Malice was fully comprehending the meaning of her next statement. They must appear, at least, to be slaughtered. And you will arrange this? Malice asked. I already have, Matron Benry assured her. But what is the purpose? When House Annette initiated its attack against you, did you call upon the Spider Queen in your struggles? Matron Benry asked bluntly. The question startled Malice, and the expected answer upset her more than a little. And when House Annette was repelled, Matron Benry went on coldly, Did you give praise to the Spider Queen? Did you call upon a handmaiden of Loth in your moment of victory, Malice Doerden? Am I on trial here? Malice cried. You know the answer, Matron Benry. She looked at Cinefe uncomfortably as she replied, fearing that she might be giving some valued information away. You are aware of my situation concerning the Spider Queen. I dare not summon a yokel until I have seen some sign that I have regained Loth's favor. And you have seen no sign, Cinefe remarked. None other than the defeat of my rival, Malice growled back at her. That was not a sign from the Spider Queen, Matron Benry assured them both. Loth did not involve herself in your struggles. She only demanded that they be finished. Is she pleased of the outcome? Malice asked bluntly. That is yet to be determined, replied Matron Benry. Many years ago, Loth made clear her desires that Malice Doerden sit upon the ruling council. Beginning with the next light of Narbundle, it shall be so. Malice's chin rose with pride. But understand your dilemma, Matron Benry scolded her, rising up out of her chair. Malice slumped back immediately. You have lost more than half of your soldiers, Benry explained and you do not have a large family surrounding and supporting you. You rule the eighth house of the city. It is known by all that you are not in the Spider Queen's favor. How long do you believe House Doerden will hold its position? Your seat on the ruling council is in jeopardy even before you have assumed it. Malice could not refute the ancient matron's logic. They both knew the ways of Menzo Baranzon. With House Doerden so obviously crippled, some lesser house would soon take advantage of the opportunity to better its station. The attack by House Annette would not be the last battle fought in the Doerden compound. So I give to you, Cinefe Annette, Shanane Doerden, a new daughter, a new high priestess, said Matron Benray. She turned then to Cinefe to continue her explanation, but Malice found herself suddenly distracted as a voice called out to her in her thoughts, a telepathic message. Keep her only as long as you need her, Malice Doerden, it said. 
Malice looked around, guessing the source of the communication. On a previous visit to House Benray, she had met Matron Benray's Mind Flayer, a telepathic beast. The creature was nowhere in sight, but neither had Matron Benray been when Malice had first entered the chapel. Malice looked around alternatively at the remaining empty seats atop the dais, but the stone furniture showed no signs of any occupants. A second telepathic message left her no doubts. You will know when the time is right. And the remaining fifty of House Annette's soldiers, Matron Benry was saying. Do you agree, Matron Malice? Malice looked at Cinefe, an expression that might have been acceptance or wicked irony. I do, she replied. Go then, Shanane Dowerden, Matron Benre instructed Cinefe. Join your remaining soldiers in the courtyard. My wizard will get you to House Dowerden in secrecy. Cinefe cast a suspicious glance Malice's way, then moved out of the Great Chapel. I understand, Malice said to her hostess when Cinefe had gone. You understand nothing, Matron Benre yelled back at her, suddenly enraged. I have done all that I may for you, Malice Dowerden. It was Lost Wish that you sit upon the ruling council, and I have arranged it, at great personal cost, for that to be so. Malice knew then, beyond any doubt, that House Benray had prompted House Annette to action. How deep did Matron Benray's influence go, Malice wondered. Perhaps the withered Matron Mother also had anticipated, and possibly arranged, the actions of Jarlaxle and the soldiers of Bregan to Earth, ultimately the deciding factor in the battle. She would have to find out about that possibility, Malice promised herself. Jarl Axel had dipped his greedy fingers quite deeply into her purse. No more, Matron Benray continued. Now you are left to your own wiles. You have not found the favor of Loth, and that is the only way you and House Dowerden will survive. Malice's fist clenched the arm of her chair so tightly that she almost expected to hear the stone cracking beneath it. She had hoped, with the defeat of House Annette, that she had put the blasphemous deeds of her youngest son behind her. You know what must be done, said Matron Benray. Correct the wrong, Malice. I have put myself forward on your behalf. I will not tolerate continued failure. The arrangements have been explained to us, Matron Mother, Dinan said to Malice when she returned to the adamantine gate of House Dorden. He followed Malice across the compound and then levitated up beside her to the balcony outside the noble quarters of the house. All of the family is gathered in the anteroom, Dinan went on. Even the newest member, he added with a wink. Malice did not respond to her son's feeble attempt at humor. She pushed Dinan aside roughly and stormed down the central corridor, commanding the anteroom door to open with a single powerful word. The family scrambled out of her way as she crossed to her throne on the far side of the spider-shaped table. They had anticipated a long meeting to learn the new situation confronting them and the challenges they must overcome. What they got instead was a brief glimpse at the rage burning with a matron malice. She glared at them alternately, letting each of them know beyond any doubt that she would not accept anything less than she demanded. Her voice grating as though her mouth were filled with pebbles, she growled, Find Drist and bring him to me! Riza started to protest, but Malice shot her a glare so utterly cold and threatening that it stole the words away. The eldest daughter, as stubborn as her mother and always ready for an argument, averted her eyes, and no one else in the anteroom, though they shared Riza's unspoken concerns, made any motion to argue. Malice then left them to sort out the specifics of how they would accomplish the task. Details were not at all important to Malice. The only part she meant to play in all of this was the thrust of the ceremonial dagger into her youngest son's chest.